Welcome to an episode of I Know I Know, a Beatles podcast, I guess we can call it at this point. My name is Hudson <laughs> Ranny, and I am one of your hosts. My other host, Tim, is here, and we're joined by a very special guest. She is an author. She is a Beatle maniac, like, <laughs> to say the least, if you um, can see her background. Um, Patty Stenman, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much, Hudson, and thank you for inviting me on this evening. I'm honored. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. Now, on today's breaking news, Tom Brady has come out of retirement. So that's the only breaking news that there is, which... Uh-huh. And I have to ask, are you seeing a certain someone named Paul McCartney? Yes, I am. I'm going to see Paul in outside of Dallas. In uh, We're going to Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, see him on the 17th of May. And uh, last time he was here, he was in Arlington, Texas, three years ago. Um, so um, we'll be here. Um, my daughters and I will be going to see him again. I, I think this might be the sixth or eighth time I'm seeing him in person. So <laughs> not not including the concerts in the 60s, of course. Of course. <laughs> wow. Wow. And I mean, I'm, I'm, je- I'm jealous. He's not coming to Canada. So <laughs> no, that's true. I'm waiting. They I'm said, waiting. Yeah. They did yeah, say North they, America. They were saying they did said North American tour. So I'm hoping he comes up across the border. Yeah, and he often goes to South America too. After, but I didn't see any South American dates as well. So mm-hmm. I guess he's still putting together, you know, parts of the tour. I imagine so, mm-hmm. or whoever puts his tour together. I'm not sure who, but yeah, I think it's it's going to be a good tour. Uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing him once again. Of course, he doesn't see me, but I see him. <laughs> no. Are there any? Is there a song or two that you would that like a the dream a dream song you'd love him to play live? Oh, I just love when he plays yesterday. I've got a very soft heart for the song yesterday, and, and anything he plays is just perfect for me. Um, I, I always say, and, and this is funny when people ask, "Well, what's your favorite Beatles song or songs?" and I say. It's really difficult. It's like picking your favorite children. It's hard to pick your favorite child. And it's so hard to fit, pick your favorite Beatles songs. But I'm, I'm excited to see him and whatever he plays, if it's from his Wings days or his recent stuff or the old Beatles stuff, it's fine with me. I just love hearing him sing. And I'm so glad he can still, you know, get out there and do what he does for so many hours without yeah. any breaks. <laughs> Yeah. Just blessed to be there. Yeah. Yeah. And now I want to go back to 1964. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. Now, do you remember life without the Beatles? Do I remember what? I'm sorry. Life without the Beatles. Oh, of course I remember life without the Beatles. Because, um, what helps me along is I, I kept this diary, which is, you know, most of my book. Uh, and the diary started when I was about 12, uh, 12 and a half. So it it really brought back memories of my life uh, as a pre-teenager in Philadelphia and things that I used to do. And it was such a different world back then, as you can imagine. And I'm sure your grandparents and parents tell you. But um Basically, our, our life revolved around school and, you know, walking to the movies on a Saturday afternoon or Friday night and being with our friends. Um, the one thing I, I want to stress, and I think you probably have heard of it, but of course we didn't have any internet to play with, you know, when we were 12. But we did have something that was like social media, not quite. We had uh, the famous uh, radio stations in the cities and also, I guess, in the country. But the radio stations were our lifeline to what was happening 
um, where there were dances on the weekend, uh, what groups were up and coming, who was playing where, um, things of that sort. And um, the the radio stations and these famous disc jockeys who were were like idols who were at these radio stations that were for young people. Um, they would tell us what was going on in, in life. So we learned a lot from that. Um, from the time we were young, we listened to you know what music was popular and and uh, where we should go next for you know our, our dance or whatever the next weekend. So it, it was uh, very different than today for young people. <laughs> wow. Now, I, I understand that you knew of the Beatles before Ed Sullivan. Is that true? Yes. Were you a fan right right then and there? Or did you become more of a fan at around when the Ed Sullivan show? Well, this is what happened, actually. The first time I, I actually saw yeah, what looked like the Beatles was in uh, an, another was a new newspaper. The the Sunday and daily newspapers were also our lifelines in those days. And the Sunday Philadelphia Bulletin newspaper, where I later worked as a journalist, they had an article uh, New Year's week, or no, what's the New Year's Eve or something, in their Sunday magazine. Uh, and it was a black and white uh, picture article about the Beatles in London. And uh, that's the first time I saw them. It was probably right around New Year's, maybe the day before. Um, I didn't pay much attention to it. But a few days later, on the 3rd of January, there was a really famous e Friday evening program with an entertainment program called the Jack Parr Show. He was sort of a commentator, and he would bring on guests and have different excerpts and things. Well, he had been to London, and he had... His photography department, or else his, his cameraman or whoever, takes some video of the Beatles on stage. It was a small venue. And it was put on uh, Jack Carr, his own show, on the 3rd of uh, January on national TV on a Friday night. And uh, it was maybe just a little snippet, maybe, you know, two minutes. But we were able to see what they looked like and what they sang. Um, and it kind of, you know, got us curious. Same time as that happened, then the disc jockeys in Philadelphia, New York, Boston, all the big cities, L.A., were beginning to be hit by um, Beatle records from the uh, you know, this, the studios and also the, uh, I guess, the recording studio. And they were trying to promote the Beatles very early. So then the, the uh, disc jockeys were playing Beatle music, a couple Beatles songs, starting around January, late January. So we've got a taste of what was happening. I wasn't actually a real fan until uh, I watched them on the Ed Sullivan show on the uh, 9th of February. But we had all this, you know, leading up to Beatlemania, um, and of course, you know, why were we so excited after we saw them on Ed Sullivan? Uh, it was a Sunday night. We went back. I was a freshman in high school and I went back to school on Monday and girls were talking about it. I went to an all girls Catholic high school and the girls were talking about it. And we kind of started right there to get excited about the Beatles and we banded into little groups. Um, I called my group the Beatle Buddy Group, but now I call them that. I didn't call them that back then. So that's how it kind of built up. And from there, that we, you know, people were selling Beatle buttons at school. We were, you know, getting information from magazines, monthly magazines, if you can imagine how old the information was, and also the disc jockeys and the newspapers. So it was all a buildup and the records were starting to, you know, come to the stores, the albums, meet the Beatles, introducing the Beatles. And um, I, I bought my girlfriend on the 7th or 8th of February for her 15th birthday. I bought her Meet the Beatles and I bought it at a supermarket, the album, if you can believe it. <laughs> so, so that was how it worked back then. How did the nuns feel about the Beatles? <laughs> well, we have a lot of old Irish nuns oh. who weren't very fond of the British. So um, 
I mean, one of my Irish nuns who is pretty old said, you know, we don't like those dirty old young English men at all. And they, they banned us from anything beetle. You know, we weren't supposed to wear beetle wigs or have beetle haircuts. They banned uh, everything. I had a, <laughs> well, yeah. they, banned, they banned everything then. <laughs> Oh, they did. Yeah. I had a made a beetle calendar for the inside of my locker door. I mean, there was nothing being sold like that. So I made it myself with some pictures and stuff. And the nun was coming down the aisle in the locker room and she saw it and she ripped it right off the door. <laughs> and uh, at, at one point, I must tell you, at one point, um, I had beetle bubble gum cards, which I still have. I have, I think, 109 beetle bubble gum cards. And I was passing them down the aisle at eighth grade, eighth period English in freshman year. And I remember my the sister St. Bernadette uh, saw me passing these beetle bubble gum cards around and she confiscated them and she took them. And I was so afraid she was going to throw them in her trash can. I was just, you know, it was so worried. So after class was over, you know, of course, she called me up on the carpet there and she had them in her hand and she said, what do you want me to do with these? And I said, I'd like them back. And she said, you have to promise me never to bring them to class again. And I haven't ever brought them to class again. And, and still I still have, have them. <laughs> so it was, it was a fun time. But it, it, of course, like I said, the, the, the good sisters were not fans of the Beatles. Uh, and uh, we we just got around it, whatever we did, you know, it, it was just funny. Um, in those days, we, we, uh, we were very young, and we were very energetic. Let's put it that way. <laughs> what did your parents think of the Beatles? You know, um, so funny about what my parents thought. Um, there was a, da a daily newspaper, a tabloid in Philadelphia, which is still there called the Philadelphia Daily News. And they had a contest. Uh, you would get $25 if you wrote why I love the Beatles or why I hate the Beatles. And if they picked your, your winning little composition. So I wrote why I love the Beatles. And uh, I won. I won 25 bucks. It was the first thing I ever won. I was so excited. But why? what was in that little essay was that my parents like them and my mother likes them because I listen to their records at home instead of hanging on the corners with boys oh, <laughs> and it was true I mean you know we were safe I mean you couldn't catch a beetle you know but you know you could hang on the corner with the boys that you weren't supposed to hang with so it was safe kept you on the street and narrow <laughs> yeah it did it, the beetle mania actually did it, it was funny that way wow so my folks liked them i mean my mom and dad never complained that my my room was decorated in beetles uh you know i went to beetle concerts uh bought beetle stuff with my uh my little weekly allowance and in those days nobody called it memorabilia we didn't even know that word it was either beetle junk or Beatles stuff, you know. Yeah. So have you ever traveled to see the, the Beatles? Um no, I when I was young, I really didn't. I I did mm -hmm. I never did. No, I, I I saw them in well, I can't let me take that back. <laughs> I, I saw them three times in person you know, back in 64 and 66. And the furthest I traveled was to Shea Stadium in August of 66 okay. to see them. And I took the Amtrak train up with my girlfriends to Shea Stadium to see them in the heart of the summer and the heat of the summer. So that's the furthest I, I traveled. I do have friends who went to London, like my friend Pat Mancuso, who you had interviewed. She had traveled to see George Harrison, who she had a fan club for. She actually saw them outside of Abbey Road and stuff. But um, I never got that far. Um, I never got further than than Shea Stadium when I was young. Wow. And where were your seats at the concerts? Oh, way up. Well, I, I take that back. The first time I saw them, which was September 2nd, 1964, at Philadelphia Convention Hall, um, 
there were seats that it was a it's a convention hall so there's it's like an amphitheater but downstairs it's flat because they had basketball games and stuff so i was downstairs on sitting on a wooden chair a folding chair um to see them and i couldn't see them because what happens was all the girls were standing on those wooden chairs to try to see the beetle and the problem was that the wooden chairs were not fastened to the floor yeah. so lots of us were falling off the chairs and the chairs were breaking and and tumbling over um and it, we just couldn't see them and we couldn't hear them at that first concert either because the acoustics were very bad and the girls were screaming in 64 very loudly did you make so, it to the did you make it to the end of a Beatles show or were you one of those ones that passed out? <laughs> oh no, I made it to, the, made end, it to but, the end. Okay. But it's so funny. And I, I brought this up recently and I I write a blog every month uh, in on my uh website. And I brought it up somewhere on that blog that uh there was a picture of me taken when I came home that evening. I don't remember how I got home. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if I took the, the trolley late or my father picked me up and my girlfriend. All I know is there's a picture of me as I came in the door at home. My face is completely flushed and I look like I've been crying a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's a funny picture. So I actually put that in my blog and saying, I remember how I got there. My dad, I know I took the trolley car. But I don't remember how I got home or why I was, you know, I, I knew I was crying. And I think I was so upset because I couldn't hear them and I couldn't see them and I love them. Yeah, yeah. So, there was a couple of times there was a couple of show where uh, times where I would wait out by the uh, arenas where Paul would drive in. And, right. You know, you'd, be, you'd be within 10 feet of him. Right. And it yeah. was just, just the whole hysteria. Like it's still there. The hysteria is still there. Oh, and it's and oops. when he drives by, it's all in a blink of an eye, and oh, everyone's yeah. just wired. Everyone, and it's still yeah. like that today. Yeah. <laughs> the funny thing is, and, and it's, I brought this up in my book, you know, which is Diary of a Beetle Maniac. I brought it up in the book that that morning, my girlfriend Kathy and I decided. Well, the, the concert was until eight o'clock in the evening, I guess. But that morning, we decided to go down to Philadelphia Convention Hall by trolley, of course. We didn't drive. And we went there, and we hid behind in this big convention center uh, early in the morning, uh, uh, back of the pillars for where the cars would come, you know. But uh, we stayed there about three or four hours. And it was summer. It was hot the beginning of September. And... Uh, around I guess around noontime and there was nobody there when we went back there it was that early in the morning but around noontime we we had to use the little girls room you know by that time so we snuck out of our little hiding place and back of the big pillars and back of this huge stone building and we went to the front of convention hall the place was mobbed there were so many girls and there were police barricades and there were policemen. So we jumped over the barricades from the other side. And, you know, we found a bathroom in the hospital across the street. And of course, we couldn't get back there again. I mean, the police wouldn't let us back, but we tried, you know, we tried to wait until to see if they came through and it didn't work. Wow. <laughs> and how did you get involved with that? Dr. Spinetti. Well, that's an interesting story because, um, of course, Victor was in both movies. And in 64, uh, oh, as I told you, the Beatles appeared in, on September 2nd uh, at Convention Hall in Philly. Uh, that summer in 64, they released the movie Hard Day's Night. And this actor named Victor Spinetti, who was a Welsh actor uh, older than them, uh, he was in the movie. Well, as I mentioned to you earlier, in um, one of our ways of finding information was to read and scour the daily newspapers. And in the daily newspaper, uh, the Philadelphia Evening Bulletin, there was this little blurb. It was right after the Beatle concert on September 2nd. It was uh, it said, 
that actor Victor Spinetti, who had been uh, in the movie, the Beatle movie, Hard Day's Night, was coming to Philadelphia to play in, in, in he was a theater. He was a theater actor more than a, a movie actor to play in a, a British uh, comedy, war comedy called Oh, What a Lovely War. Prior to its try, it's going to try out in Philadelphia, and then it's going to New York on Broadway. So they had the date that the, it was going to start, and then they, I, for some reason, I got the idea that I bet you he's going to stay at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel, which is the hotel near the theater district in Philly, and it wasn't very far away from my high school. And my high school was in almost in the center of town in Philadelphia. So. What we did was, what I did is I wrote him a letter. Because what did you do in those days? You wrote letters. Yeah. I wrote a letter to the Bellevue Stratford Hotel in, in, in his name, care of uh, Bellevue Stratford, put the address of the Bellevue Stratford, said I was a Beatle fan and I saw him, blah, 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 in the movie, not knowing what was going to happen. Well, he answered me right away. He was there already and in rehearsals starting. So he was such a sweet letter. And in fact, they in my book that my publisher had published the first page of that letter saying, thank you for your letter. And he talked a little bit about the Beatles and how he was friends with them. And then he said, um, if you'd like, stop down at the Forest Theater, which was only a couple blocks away from the hotel he was staying in. And uh, we rehearse every day. And I'd love to see you and your friends and we could talk. Well, we did. Our school was very close. We'd have our school uniforms on. We'd have our books with us, go right after school on the trolley car down to the Forest Theater. And that's how we met Victor. And it was my little group of, there were one, two, there were four of us. And we went down there every day. He would come out in between rehearsals he would talk to us, and there were other girls there, too, who were Beatles fans. And um, he just talked to us about the Beatles, about himself, and we really got to like him. And I remember we went to see the play on a Saturday matinee in Philly, and we brought this enormous sheet cake for him. And we had it on our lap during the whole, <laughs> the whole performance, you know, waiting for him um, to, uh, after. And uh, we really before he left town, and we went to see him every day. Before he left to go to New York City, we thought, you know, it'd be nice, it'd be nice to have a fan club. Well, you got to understand, Hudson, that in those days there were fan clubs for everything. I mean, the the Mickey Mouse Club, and that for the cello, Frankie Avalon, you name it. There was a fan club for that, and there were all young girls that had these fan clubs. So we decided to start a club for Victor. And of course, at that point, we didn't know he had other fan clubs, but he had, I think he had one in Boston. He had one in Brooklyn. He had some in England. So we had the official Victor Spinetti fan club, chapter one, Philadelphia. And uh, we went to visit him in New York when he was in a with a lovely war. We took the Amtrak train up there at age you know, 15 which is amazing when you think of it. And uh, we would go up and visit him. And he was so incredibly sweet to his fans. He was such a gentleman. And at one point, uh, it was so funny. We went to see the play again. It was at the Broadhurst Theater on Broadway. And it was a hit. And we saw the play. And after the play, he said to the four of us, he said, come on, I'm going to show you something interesting. So the play was over. He took us out on stage. It was an empty stage by this time. And he said, look, you're on a Broadway stage. Look out now. And, it, you know, there was nobody in the audience. But I remember that all my life, how sweet it was that he took us out on a Broadway stage and, and gave us that experience. Wow. Sweetest man. Mm -hmm. And um, the fan club, had about 50 to 70 members. Um, we, it was just the girls at school. They didn't even know who Victor Spinetti was, which just coerced them into 25 cents joining the fan club. It wasn't a really well put together fan club like some of the others. We did a mimeograph newsletter maybe once a month. 
and it lasted through high school until we graduated. So, but <clears throat> I was friends with Victor for the rest of his life. I got to see him at Beetle Fest when he was quite old, and we sat down and we we had a great chat over dinner. And I visited him in London once uh, back in the 70s. So um, he stayed friends with me and he would write to me and call me. And he knew about my book and he was excited about it. He even tried to get me a publisher, so which was very sweet of him. Wow. And speaking of Beetle Fest, or should I? All right, is it the Fest for Beatles fans now? Yeah, today it's called the Fest for Beatles fans, but in the old days it was just called Beatle Fest. They kind of changed the name somewhere along the way. You will be appearing at that said called Fest in New York City. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it's actually a Jersey City uh, across from Manhattan. It's at the Hyatt Regency where they usually have it. I've been at several fests uh, appearing with my book and uh, I'm so looking forward to it because, of course, due to the pandemic, we haven't had a fest for two years. This would have been the third year we missed. So we're all looking forward to it. And it starts on Friday, the 1st of April and Saturday and Sunday that weekend. And there's going to be a lot of authors there with their books, including my friend Pat Mancuso. And... Uh, We'll be there, and we'll probably be on a panel, too, I hear, uh, called First Generation Fans. And I call myself a first generation fan, but I love calling myself a vintage fan. <laughs> I think that's a nice nice term for it at my age. <laughs> wow. But, oh, my gosh. That's crazy to think that it's been two years without a Beatle Fest. Like, because just, I've seen, I've never actually been, but, like, you see the pictures, but it's going to be crazy. You know, I forgot to tell you when I was talking about Victor. I'm sorry to backtrack a little bit, but this is his autobiography. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah. That's his autobiography. Okay. And he mentioned us in it, of course. And on the back cover, this is a funny story. It says, there's a picture of him and John mm -hmm. in health. And the caption is, this is the back cover. A Vic, said John, you know, we're really impressed with your fan club, Victor. Do you think we can join? <laughs> and there's a funny story about that because um, we actually sent membership cards to the Beatles uh, when they were, when Victor was with them in the uh Caribbean in the Bahamas uh, filming help and Victor gave them the membership cards so the Beatles became members of the Victor Spinetti fan club <laughs> which was funny I thought and the other thing I wanted to show you is Victor was very generous with his uh, gifts to us and when he was filming before he filmed in the Bahamas he sent the fan club and he sent it to my house. He sent a menu. I can think oh, you could see this menu. Oh, but no. it was a menu. And it's, please don't tell me it's autographed by the Beatles. Yes, all four <laughs> on the back page. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Yeah, there's a part of you see Paul and John are in pencil, Ringo and wow. George are in pen. Wow. And you didn't know this was coming to you. It just showed up in the mail one day. Yes. He did it for the fan club. And inside it, he says, for all at Philly, love Victor Spinetti. At present, working on Beatles 2. It wasn't called Help. Right. It was Beatles 2. <laughs> Steve back page for autographs of the four lads. So there's what, there was the... Holy crap. That was it. And this is the menu from the plane where they were flying from London I think they were flying from London to New York. It was called the Beatles Bahamas Special, and it was a menu. And and actually, I've looked online, and I saw some other people receive this, like the pilot of the plane received one of these, too. Okay. And it gets even better, and Victor gave us all kinds of little gifts. Um, I'll show you something else, <laughs> okay? It was my, my, my 15th 
it was my 15th birthday or my 16th birthday. I can't remember now, but my mother wrote to Victor. Everybody knew Victor by that time. <laughs> he used to call the house and my mother would answer or whatever. So I get this envelope. My mother got this envelope in the mail. It says, Mrs. Gallo, Patty's mom. And it has my address. And in it, in it, in it is, I have to show you this. In it is a postcard from Salisbury where they were filming help. Oh, and wow. my birthday was coming up. It was a special thing. My mom says, can you give Pat, can you get something special for Patty for her birthday? Okay, to oh, Patty. No, bye, Mama I'm done. <laughs> Happy birthday, love. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah. wow. Wow. That was for my birthday. That was because my mother pushed Victor. Well, it gets better. Okay. One more thing. Okay. <laughs> so I got that and I thought, woo. Oh my goodness. Oh no. Victor went one step further. He was such a sweet guy. He went to the studio hairdresser at Twickenham Studio and he got a lock of Paul McCartney's hair for me. <laughs> no. So you could. Yeah. If you, I can could, clone you could clone him. you could clone paul mccartney I, we have this standing joke in my family that i'm going to be sitting on the the, the uh, balcony at, at a condo in maui with my paul mccartney butler <laughs> okay. there he is this, hmm, don't give me uh, ideas here don't give me ideas okay. at these, it's beautiful hair actually i kept saying well is it like my color or what and actually it's more of a chestnut color than mine so it's, uh, it was, but anyway, I, I wanted to show you those because Victor was very generous with his gifts yeah. and he gave us a lot of little trinkets too, you know, that were used by the Beatles when they were filming and stuff. But you that, mentioned, that was, you mentioned jokes within the family. So what do they think of your, uh, Beatle fandom and <laughs> do they think you're a weirdo or do they support it or <laughs> my, my, my two daughters are very supportive. They know me by now. They know that, for example, this is my third bedroom in the house. It's my beetle boudoir. It's decorated in beetles, the whole room, you know. They know this is me, and that's part of me. Mm -hmm. So they, they accept it. They're not as big beetle fans as I thought they would be, even though from the time they were little, they listened to them in the car when I took them to, you know, band practice or whatever I had to go. But they, they, I think they prefer the doors, which is awful. <laughs> but they understand me, and and uh, you know anybody who knows me just knows it's part of my life, and uh, because that's who I've been since I've been fourteen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're a family. <laughs> we're, yes, we are yeah, a family. The Beatle, the Beatle fandom is yeah. But when I'm thinking about you guys, and you guys are very young. I'm so pleased that it is going down to your generation now because that means the Beatles will always live. You know, uh, my generation is is fading away, which is sad, but the first generation, I mean, when we used to go to Beatle Fest years ago, I, the place was like mobbed with first generation Beatle fans. Then it came time where we'd see them in wheelchairs and, you know, such and such can't come because she's in a, on a walker or, so, you know, it, so her husband's just passed away and a lot of people passed away. So um, the first generation fans are not going to be here, you know, for too, too much longer. Although we, we'd like to live forever. You know? yes. So I'm glad we got your generation coming up. Thank you very much. That's very meaningful. You're welcome. We'll, we'll keep it alive until Keith. Yeah, you will. I As know you will. Richard is alive. <laughs> the Beatles will be alive. Now, I have to ask you, I was reading the book and you mentioned going to your friend, with your friends to go get something new when it was brand new. Yeah. Um, in that record store. Yeah. So, did you hang out at the record store a lot? We didn't really hang out at the record store. We, well, the record store in our neighborhood was called Jolly's Record Store. And we would go there to buy new albums. And that was about it. But I remember, for example, 
there was publicity, you know, for the albums when they came out. And when Help came out, the the album, uh, it was really weird. I, I've only seen it once in a memorabilia book. There was this little box that they had that was um, motorized. And out of this little box came this hand with Ringo's rings on it, you know, and then it would go back in the box. And it was really a cool little piece of, you know, equipment, memorabilia, whatever. And my girlfriend, Diane, somehow got the guy who owned Jolly's record store to give it to her after the promotion was over. So we used to go to her room, which was decorated from top to bottom in Beatles, and we'd see this hand coming out of this paper box and help, you know, advertise. So um, it was fun, though. I mean, we didn't really hang at the record stores uh, at all. Uh, we, we usually hung in bedrooms, my girlfriend's bedroom that was decorated and my bedroom. And and we listened in those days. We listened on our, you know, small record players uh, to the Beatles. Uh, my, unfortunately, my record player was in my parents' living room, which was a bummer. Um, but my girlfriend had a small one up in her bedroom and we could listen to them better there, you know? So it was, uh, it was a different world. And uh, I, I think that you had to be there to understand it because the world is so different today, you know, with the internet and social media, it's just so different. You know, we... And in order for us, I mean, we went to see A Hard Day's Night and Help many times at the movies because there weren't any DVDs. There weren't any way we could see it on our, on our you know, computers. We had to go to the movies to see that movie. And uh, the funny thing is that we bought books that had the dialogue of those films so we could understand the film better and we knew what they were saying because... You know, what did we see? Maybe four or five times we saw it in the movie theater or at the the, the drive-in theaters, which was even better because we would stick some girls who could not afford to go. We'd stick them in the trunk, you know, and go into the drive-in theater. I imagine you went to see the uh, the IMAX a few weeks ago, the B, the Let It Be IMAX. Did you go? You know, I missed it because it was playing only one place mm. in Dallas, but. I, I did join Disney Plus for about three weeks so I could see it on my, you know, at home on my TV. So I did see it, but not in IMAX. I wish I could have. But um, it wasn't very well advertised here. Dallas is really not a Beatles city, mm. you know, like New York or, you know, L.A. LA. So uh, things weren't re really advertised very much about where and when it was, was playing, unfortunately. Mm. But... I did get to see it still, so. <laughs> yeah, you, didn't, you didn't miss much. It was good. The sound was great. Paul's bass really comes, really came through. But in terms, like for me, in terms of the, the recording itself, it was, it was, it was okay. It was just loud. But I really, loud, I was yeah. really, but I was really impressed with, 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 they, they brought out Paul's bass. That was, it was excellent. Yeah. Hey, I thought it was interesting from several viewpoints. But one viewpoint I thought it was very interesting is because when I was young, we looked a lot at Beatle girlfriends and Beatle wives because we were jealous of everybody, you know, and we wanted to see what they were wearing and who they were dating and that kind of stuff. So I thought it was interesting because, you know, you saw a lot of Yoko Ono, you saw a lot of, of, of Linda, you saw just the smidgen of Maureen. And and then of, of course Patty. Patty was I think in only one one area of the of the uh, whole show. So it it was it was fun from that point of view that we saw the Beatles wives and girlfriends uh, at the same time. And uh, it's all it always was a, a topic of conversation for us because <clears throat> being young teenagers, we actually mimicked them and we dressed like them and we dressed mod and. We always like to see what they were wearing and and who who the Beatles were with 